We want to protect our mental health and we want to just be better human beings, which is why we are so excited to be having this conversation with you today. We are joined by Christina. I want to make sure I say your last name correctly. Mancuso. Perfect. Christina <laughs> Mancuso. <laughs> now I can say it confidently. That's awesome. You are a therapist. You specialize in, you know, just so many different facets of health, wellness, mental health. So can you break down your background a little bit? Sure. Mm -hmm. So some of the areas of specialty that I have that are the more challenging areas are trauma, addiction, eating disorders, early childhood related issues, mm -hmm. um, a lot of core self work. Mm -hmm. And then I also work in a lot of populations with people who are just um, maybe they're familiar with the process and they have a good solid self-awareness, but they're interested in perfecting a particular area, professional growth opportunity, relationship challenges, things like that. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with people who are either founders or in high executive positions that are facing challenges that, you know, are hard to kind of really have somebody to articulate that with at work because mm -hmm. they're kind of at the top tier. Right. And so I love that population mm -hmm. because they're very aware mm -hmm. and they have a good appreciation for the process. Right. Cause it's this idea of getting better. Yeah. And you know, if I had to guess, obviously I'm not like Jeff Bezos or anything like that, but <laughs> <laughs> nor do I have any desires to be a billionaire. However, I, I am very successful in my career, very sure. driven and lots of hard work went behind it. But the idea of getting better, is very appealing to me. Yeah. So I wouldn't even know where to start. I would just want to get better. It's like, oh, therapy makes you a better person, a better human being. It automatically attracts me. Yeah. I'm pretty open-minded in that regard, which I'm very thankful about because I feel like therapy in general has this stigma behind it. And I don't think we should be living like that. I think it's okay to say, hey, I might need some extra help. I need some tools to cope with life because life is hard. Absolutely. And that is exactly what is empowering people so much more today in yeah. that it did carry such a stigma and that really has lessened over the years, yeah. especially post pandemic and people just recognizing that they have to be more verbal about For sure. whatever their vulnerabilities are. And it absolutely empowers people. The things that kind of go on up there that we're afraid to maybe bring to a conscious level when we're not talking about them, they're much more in control. Mm -hmm. Those thoughts are kind of really guiding us. But when we really start taking a look and allowing ourselves to kind of unpack yes. a lot of that, um, immediately that puts somebody in more of a place of control. Yeah especially somebody who has not been in the process before and doesn't know what that looks like. That's just right away putting your arms around it. What made you want to do this work? You know, I think I've known this is what I was intended to do from a very, very young age. It's wow. really been part of my personality. Um, very young. You know, I was kind of the friend that people would go to. And I was that person who was uh, the person at work, even that, you know, people would kind of lean on. Uh, it just, it really was naturally something that um, was part of who I am. Yeah. And so I was doing it from a very young age. I mean, even through high school, I had interned at some of the major. Stop it. Mm -hmm. But my first internship, and I graduated pretty young from um, high school and college, like I was pretty academic younger. And back then they kind of had programs. You can go in and skip a grade, skip a grade. So I was 15, I think, working at um, Creedmoor, which is one of, you know, the city facilities. I had a good portion of my early career in a lot of the areas where you saw a lot of um, the, the stuff that allows you to build a good foundation, yeah. that is the tougher stuff, but yeah. I'm appreciative of that because that's kind of yeah. what allowed me to build that so strongly. Yeah. When it comes to trauma and when you're talking to your client, can you immediately tell the kind of trauma that they've went through by how they're reacting or how they're responding to you? Yeah, so you don't, 
I wouldn't necessarily know the type of trauma, right? But what you can identify uh, based on the way someone is behaving around it and their level of discomfort with the way in which they present is how much they've internalized the trauma. Ooh. So, you know, sometimes somebody can see the trauma as something outside of themselves. And mm -hmm. sometimes it, because it becomes something that they've internalized so much mm -hmm. that it's hard to separate the two. Right, yeah. So sure. someone who has internalized it more, it's the, the extent of the work and reaching that with right. that person becomes a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. So when you say internalize, do you mean like they're keeping it in and it's something that's not getting released or something they're not kind of bringing out of themselves? I mean, obviously I understand what the word internalize means, yeah, but yeah. in this sense, what does internalizing something mean for so, someone? So what I mean by that is, um, let's say something really horrific happens to someone and you know it wasn't at their will and it wasn't something that they necessarily participated in wanting it to occur to them. But as a result, they feel like this piece of them is um, part of who they are. It's become part of the way in which they relate outward. Mm. And so sometimes people will even take on patterns of behavior that mimic that Wow. Like, let's say for a rape, for example, mm -hmm. someone might become promiscuous in ways because they feel like, well, that's part of who I am now. It's become part of me. And allowing somebody to recognize, separate from the two, because, you know, the, the trauma becomes then part of mm. their own shame in it, mm. as opposed to you know, being able to feel empowered and recognize that this is something that was put on to you, not something that you brought on to yourself or any part of who you are. Seems so heavy to try to tackle a right. subject like that with with someone. Like how how long does it take to be able to get to a point where you can separate yourself? And I know it's not a one answer for everyone. Yeah. But like, how do you realize when you're getting close to that point where you can separate that it's not you? Um, so you mean for the, for the, for, the client yeah, who's for the coming client. in? So I think, you know, every person is different, mm -hmm. right? Everybody approaches a level of readiness at a different time. I often will say to clients, you know, I see the whole process that if, regardless of what the presenting issue is, whether it's trauma related, whether it's somebody, whatever that presenting issue is, people will come in and, you know, start to, like I had mentioned earlier, unravel a lot of what, you know, is leading mm. to these thoughts, what's leading to these patterns of behavior. They start to feel more empowered. We start to be able to kind of see things, look and feel and touch what's going on. Then light bulbs go off, right? Mm people start to gain awareness around things like, oh, I see, I get it. It starts to clear up. And sometimes that's enough for people, like gaining the awareness, having a good understanding, saying, you know, oh, I see, I understand now, like why this was going on. Maybe it's enough. Maybe it's enough for that moment. Mm. Um, and, then, and then there are others who will come to me sometimes and say, you know, I, I, I have a good solid self-awareness. I love my therapist. I've been in therapy for years. So why do I keep doing this? You know, I, that awareness, I have it. And I'll say, well, you know, that, that awareness is essential. It is a big part of the process. But then what? Right now, you know, now what? What do you do about it? What do you do differently that allows you to live differently? That's a good client for me also. It's, mm -hmm. it's that next step it's applying modifications around your life that allow you to do it differently so that you're no longer repeating the same way so that was a long drawn out answer to no, your question great. but to answer the question it's you know everybody 
everyone's process looks differently. It's a matter of how ready someone is and how much they're able to tolerate in that moment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's, it's, it evolves and it's continual. I mean, I learn things about myself all the time. Once you gain awareness in that way, it's, it's always a continuum. What are some things we should be looking for when we're trying to get to the point of, oh, I need therapy, right? And it's like that self-realization that a lot of times we avoid. But what are some things that we should be mindful of that might indicate it's that time? You know, when clients come to me for the first time, yeah. typically there's a driver of some sort, right? They'll say to me, mm. my sleep is off, or I find myself to be more angry lately than not, or my relationship is struggling. So when somebody reaches a point where there's some sort of disruption, right? They, we might push it down, push it down, push it down, and then things start happening. Like, boop, yeah. you're like, ooh. Why did I go from zero to 100 just right. like that, right? Or why am I so angry often? Those are typically the signs that somebody is needing to address something. Now, from there, that presenting issue, it can morph into so many different things. People come in and say, you know, oh, well, I don't think I like my job. It turns into, you know, my relationship or, you know, I feel like I compromise too often or I'm not happy with where this part of my relationship is at. So I think, I think it's somebody is no longer capable of pushing things down and they view it initially as, you know, a weakness, but it's actually your inner strength saying like, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. Somebody pay attention or I'm going to make you, I'm going to keep you up at night. I'm going to get you angry often. And then it, prompt somebody to respond. Yeah. Wow. That makes sense. Cause what we're seeing from people is really the manifestation of what is going on internally. Right. And how they're projecting it and what that really means. And I, I just yeah. think that's really good insight. And I think it allows people to have more empathy in general, right? If you're on the receiving end of maybe passive aggressive energy or someone's frustration, not saying that they're entitled to mistreat you, but there's more understanding. It's not me. It's them. They're feeling yeah. some type of way. Yeah. Whether, whether they can share it or not. Right. Or whether it, they have the awareness, right? Even, to even understand. Yes. Right. Yes. For sure. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to like have that self, you know, reflective moment and you have to like be honest with yourselves. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like friendships and, you know, intimate relationships and family dynamics, right? So when it comes to therapy, I hear it, but do families, a whole unit come in for a therapy session and what, and why would they be like, what would be like the core reason people would come in as a whole family unit? So, you know, sometimes, yes, they do. They do come in together. Sometimes the family work that you can do around, you know, even individual work with one person can sometimes affect an entire family, right? Because Ooh. the one person, when they grow and shift their role, it shifts everything, right? So yes. everybody is reacting to that. And so just to allow some, the, the rest of the family to gain an understanding, gain some awareness around where someone is at, understand maybe why things were breaking down before and what will allow them to move forward in a way where they can grow together that, and the therapy sometimes provides a safer space to be able to allow everyone to see that without maybe some of the patterns of the way they were communicating that with one another yeah. in the unit. But I see family work as, you know, it's an essential piece even in just um, gaining a good understanding of who someone is, it's part of my work with every client and mm -hmm. taking a look back mm -hmm. to understand what their role within the family was like. Mm -hmm. Wow. So okay. you get to a point where you're actually, if people are telling you a story about a fight that happened, yeah. do you get to a point where you're like, okay, you were right and you were wrong. I mean, maybe yeah, not you that. Call them out? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, okay, you're wrong. Um, so I'm not the conventional type therapist. You know, there are some who will sit and be supportive and allow someone to come to their own thoughts and conclusions around things. 
um, and just kind of be a soundboard, which that is a particular type, and that's great too. But I definitely allow for there to be more of a communication between my clients and allowing, guiding them more around the areas that, you know, that the hard things that they may need to look at that mm -hmm. they otherwise aren't really even aware or taking accountability for. The idea for me is I want someone to be able to grow, right? The idea is you want to be able to see this and learn and grow and I'll be where someone is at. So mm -hmm. I won't push someone to a point of discomfort, but I'll hold a mirror when they need to see it to kind of allow them to understand like no pressure, but this is one of the areas where there's opportunity for you. So you said that's not a conventional way of doing it? You know, I think more people are less restricted in mm -hmm. their forms of therapy, but historically things were, you know, not really verbalized in the way that they are today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody, you would allow someone to reach that place on their own, mm -hmm. um, allow them to establish whether or not they have feelings around doing it one way or another way, where the difference in the way I might approach that is I might say to them, well, if you do it like this, this is what's probably going to be your outcome. And if you do it like this, it's probably going mm. to work like this. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's... I think it, it saves a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a call to action. Yeah. yeah, I think most... I think that's why I'm received very well yeah. also. And my clients can appreciate it because I do build a relationship and trust with clients. You know, obviously, I'm not... They're not walking in and I'm saying, you should do it like this. But I think they know that when I'm telling them the differences in the ways that they can approach things, they're, they... Ha then you hold yourself accountable, right? You Correct, have yeah. to see it. Yeah. There's no like, oh, well, you know, and and that is how I try to do it. I, I, I operate from a place that is correct. I always tell my clients that. And if you allow that to guide you, when you feel ready, you really can't go wrong in right. that space. When it comes to families that seek therapy, Okay, so who, I know this is such a generalized question, but who's always in the wrong? Like, is it the mom, is it the dad? Like The husband. The, what is like the popular, obviously I know every family's different, dynamics are different, you know, but in general, like what are the popular issues, the yeah. screens? Okay, so I'm gonna give you some insight around the family work. Yes, so yes, yes. When, when I say that there are, that clients come in and they will, talk about that presenting issue, right? Right. And then we'll gain some awareness around that. I always take a look back, a look back as early as their family of origin. Mm -hmm. And someone may say, you know, I was the giver in my family. I was the least needy. I required the least. But later in life, that has cultivated into, um, I my relationships are all give Ooh. or... I don't feel validated or recognized for my accomplishments at work. And so wow. when that role, we continue to cultivate that role through life, right? We take on aspects of that role because it feels familiar. It kind of feels like our job. I'll say to someone, well, when did you start doing that? And they'll say, I don't know. I don't even particularly like doing that. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know when I started doing that. If, felt familiar. It felt like something I should do. That's a lot of the authentic self stuff that I talk about because at the core, you might be a giver, but that doesn't mean that you walk into a room and you don't have a seat at the table. It doesn't mean that you compromise in every relationship that you're in yeah. because that is what you did at the core in your family. Wow. So what are the different roles? Like, so there's a giver. What a, I assume there's a, there's got to be someone who's the taker, right? <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, there, there's definitely givers and takers. You know, yeah. well, if there's a giver, right, there's typically one in the family who is the, requires the most, right? They're the ones who are the vocal ones. They are the ones who definitely have their opinions heard. And, um, but, you know, it's so interesting. 
every family dynamic is so different, right? I will always ask clients, who do you feel more aligned with? Who is more, who did you feel like was more your type growing up? What was your relationship with mom? What was your relationship with dad? If you could give me a few adjectives to describe you and all of your siblings, what would it be? Because it gives me insight into what the family operated like. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it could be, and it could be dad was somebody who, you know, wanted all great things for their kids. But the way in which that translated to mm -hmm. the kids was, you know, my dad has such high expectations. Mm -hmm. And so I have to make sure that it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, think about the way a little kid is formulating these truths. That's why the process of therapy is so important because we carry that truth mm. for so many years and we solidify it as an actual truth. And as they're talking about it, people still, and they hold it close to the vest, they protect it. Very often I'll have to work through a period with clients where they're like, well, no, I, I don't mind that. Or, you know, my dad is, and I say to them all the time, this is, we're not looking to point blame here at all, right? right. This is just for us to go back, to take right. a look at the younger version and the truths that you established to, to find accuracy around, are they in fact truths? Maybe they're a lot scarier up here than they actually are. And very often they are. And either way, even if they were scary, they are so much more in control when it comes out. Right. And that's the process of resolving. That's mm -hmm. the resolution. So then you're free of it. Then at that point, you can move on from it, even if there is the need for some forgiveness, the need for taking some accountability and forgiving yourself. But it's clear, there's mm -hmm. clarity, and it's resolved. I've heard there's different dynamics, for example, like it could be like the passive father and then like the narcissistic mother. Yes. Or the passive mother and the cheating narcissistic father. In your experience, what do you see more of? Um, and how does that happen? You know, I can't really say that there's any one over sure. the other. There are certainly all of those types that right. you mentioned. And, you know, how it happens is... Their childhood. Is just like what we were talking <laughs> yeah. about, right? Yeah. So the needy one, there's going to be one who's definitely the more outspoken one. So yeah. that one who is not as empowered might go find the narcissist, right? Because yeah. there's an attraction to that. They're the one who, you know, can walk into a room and command it. And so there's a draw. And, you know, how how everyone balances that and whether or not there's dysfunction or toxicity in it right. is dependent upon, you know, the relationship, how they parented. Right. Did the narcissism come into the home life? You know, not that you can always separate the two, but the narcissist is too self-aware right. and has worked on themselves, has a better chance of not, you know, becoming the narcissistic parent. Right. I've, been seeing a lot of this lately, but can a narcissist change and, or is that who they are at their core? And they're just, that's it. There's no going back. You know, I, I always say in the, in this process, there are two requirements. People have to have desire and ability mm -hmm. in the absence of desire. There's no chance, right? You can't have ability right. if there's no desire at all. But if you, have desire, I can always cultivate somebody's ability. Right. Um, so I guess the nar one of the big narcissistic qualities is that they're never really wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. They don't need to change, they're perfect. Yeah, yeah. So the desire piece would need to yeah. be there. And if that's there, sure, they can change, you know, to the degree of how much is, how much it's desired, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting on a scale of like extremely narcissistic and maybe a baby amount of narcissism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like, or you might have some hope yeah. in improving your you or, know, self. Or, you know, sometimes people have narcissistic traits, yes. but they're not necessarily narcissists, right? They can behave in narcissistic ways at times, but they don't necessarily have to be a 
full blown narcissist. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like narcissists, they destroy everything that's in their path for the most part, right? I mean, yeah. in general. Well, you know, it's kind of like they continue to live this self fulfilling prophecy of, yes. you know, how they behave in relationships mm -hmm. and then how they ultimately destroy them and create a victimization around it. And mm -hmm. it's never them, right? It's always the other person. Always, yeah. But then there's no desire, right? People come in and I tell them, listen, I'm really good, but I'm not a magician. You have to show up <laughs> and actually want to do the work, right? If we blame everybody else, you can blame everybody else, but. Did, have you told someone straight up, you're a narcissist? No. Okay. <laughs> no, but but what I have told, I've had people come in and say, I'm afraid I'm a narcissist. And I say, well, that's why you're not, because somebody who is would never say something like that, right? They wouldn't Interesting. be afraid of that. Um, no, I mean, what I have said to people is when they behave in ways that lean in on that behavior, like, well, I didn't do it and it's never going to change and it's just the way it is. I, I will definitely say, well, you did do it a little. Yeah. And also, you know, we can change it. And if you don't want to, that's okay. We, I'll wait. Mm. I can hold your hand with you and wait until you're ready. But I need you to recognize that you can, right? You can. Right. And more often than not, even with some of the hardest personalities, I will reach them in that way, you know, in, because otherwise then I'm not doing my job, right? right. Do you think everybody needs therapy? A hundred percent. I mean, from young. No, I mean, I think sometimes, be honest with you, I think, I think more parents need therapy than the children necessarily do. That doesn't mean that there are some that actually do, but I find that um, very often the parents at what, for whatever reason there is, like there's frustration because the child is acting out. There's frustration because, you know, they're not um, responding in the way that they need them to. They'll say, oh, well, the child is problematic. But very often that is something that needs to be addressed with a parent mm -hmm. because, you know, if it's, children need to feel safe and loved, now, this is, of course, in the absence of there being something like organic that's occurring that, um, you know, is developmental in some way. But just behavior issues, if they're acting out, there's just like with adults, there's typically a reason. There's something mm. going on. And the family stuff allows you to see, like, why is that? Why is that when the scapegoat? Why is this being overlooked? Why are we not addressing it? What's going on in the parenting style maybe that, you know, doesn't allow someone to feel like they can assert as a parent and figure out what's going on at the core. I read something that if you're a parent and like the sound of your child crying, obviously like becoming a mom, I never want my child to be in pain. So take that factor out. But yeah. they were just, wherever I read it, talked about, how the cries and agony and pain opens up your childhood wound of when you were in pain and agony and maybe that wasn't taken care of or something like that. And I was like, oh my gosh. So now I just, I want <laughs> our child to just cry and I'd be okay and not yeah. like jump to the rescue. But is there some truth behind that? Or I mean, what that implies is that there's some really unresolved stuff with oh, the parents. Damn it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. If somebody is so triggered by right. something that, you know, I would say that person should go to therapy, right? right? Because if it's if it's triggering a response in some way that's allowing them to feel so sad and so defeated. reactive yeah, too, reactive. right? Reactive to yeah. what was going on with them. Reactive, that's a great word. Yeah. So so anything like that, I mean, anything that somebody feels like they're, to answer the question from earlier yeah. too, any area that they don't feel completely in control of, this triggers me, right? This right. makes me feel a particular way. Okay, well, let's figure out why. That's not good. Yeah. When it comes to friendships, do friends go to therapy? And why would they go to therapy in general? Together? Yeah. Or yeah, they're like, hey, 
we want to work on our friendship. We're going to therapy. Like, is that, I don't want to say common practice, but have you seen that? Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen lots of people who bring their relationship, whether it be just a friend mm -hmm. issues into the work. I have seen founders that are two people working within building a company together that and don't have any relationship sure. interest or family involvement, but you know, their relationship is standing in the way of allowing their business to develop in a way that it needs to. Yeah. What does someone do in that situation? What do you, how do you, what tools do you give them to cope in that situation? Because I so, imagine it being hard to be in that position. Yeah. I mean, I think every situation, again, of it course. varies, right? Like, let's say there were two, you know, people who were friends before. Right then maybe the shift in the work relationship didn't allow for the friendship to stay intact, right? right? And like, or the other way around, maybe they are working in this professional area and the friendship piece stands in the way. So I think what is most important is to be able to build upon the communication, right? Like right. it needs to be very clear we need to compartmentalize certain things. I think a lot of what I find in relationships like that that has gone wrong is that there wasn't enough groundwork done yeah. to secure them for success, right? Like yeah. you can't just you can't just say, "Well, we're friends. It's going to be great, right. right? It's going to work out." You need to have those tough conversations yeah. and say like, "Okay, well, we both agree that we're going to put this many hours in and I'm not going to assume that you're going to yeah. work whenever, you know, whatever the rules are yeah. so that there's a plan. In all of my work with clients, I will always say without a plan, you can't be successful. Yeah. That's a big piece of it, right? Even I'm going to have this conversation with my mom. I'm like, okay, what's your plan? Because Give me the plan, yeah. And let's, I will, I will prepare people for the best scenario, the worst scenario, or maybe no scenario at all. What if she doesn't show? Like, are Oof. you still wanting to make the effort to do this? Because if those three instances are present, somebody can't go wrong. They vetted every possible outcome and the likelihood of them being prepared for any of those mm -hmm. is solidified. So even therapy in preparation for an event that could traumatize you or, you know, have big feelings that you can have big feelings about that. That is what people come in for. Like, oh, I'm about to talk to my mom for the first time in 10 years. Well, very often it will be a build up to that. Right. Those mm -hmm. big relationships um, are often like the focal point of some of the work. Mm -hmm. And so then getting somebody to a place of, you know, solidifying what now is their new version of the truth, mm -hmm. that, that has to continue to be cultivated. So you have to then still prepare, okay, so, you know, people will, let's say, for example, it's a, a challenging relationship with a parent and a child, and I've worked with the child. We've cleared that up, whatever their version of the truth is. We really try to solidify that, not allow the old versions to come in. Mm -hmm. But when you portray that outward, people will test it, right? Sometimes, sometimes people back up and they take a look and they're trying to see, well, how sure is she in that place, <laughs> right? Sometimes people will poke and see, well, is she sure? I'm going to see if this works or if that works, right? And sometimes people fall off, right? And, and maybe they should have a long time ago. And sometimes people fall off for a little bit and then they resurface, but solidifying that stance. So preparing people for those conversations that are going to be testing this new version of themselves. When it comes to relationships, intimate relationships, and, you know, we talk about love and like connection. Lately, I've been hearing a conversation about chemistry in a relationship right, in intimate relationships. 
and oh, there's no chemistry, it's not gonna work, or the spark is gone, mm. how to spice it up. Are people, I don't know, is that more of a personal kind of issue where you kind of always feel like you need to be revved up in order for a relationship to be exciting or compelling? And now you're like, oh, I feel bored in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good topic. And yes. it comes up a lot um, with a lot of my clients who are at that age where they're dating and they're seeing different people. And, you know, they'll say, well, I met this guy and he's great. And, you know, they're all head over heels for that one. And, but, and they overlook the stuff that's coming up, right? Like they'll say to me, he told me he doesn't want a relationship, but then he called me from his mother's house. Don't you think that that means that? And I'm like, no, didn't he tell you he didn't want to be in a relationship? Believe him because he'll show you if you didn't <laughs> right. believe him, he will. And, but that piece is what they start leaning in on. And then there's somebody else who shows up and he's present and he's calling and they're like, hmm. You know, so there's a couple of things to that, right? Sometimes I will tell people, listen, that's okay. If you really, really wanted to be with somebody who was going to be seriously taking a relationship in consideration, mm -hmm. that would look a lot more attractive to you. And this one who told you that right. he's not looking for one, would no longer be of interest to you because he told you, believe him. Right. He will show you if you're not convinced, <laughs> right. right? But to take that a little bit further, sometimes what happens in that, that spark that yes. you were saying is that, you know, that can be, you know, somebody who was in a relationship with that guy, the one who I mentioned who, they really thought they liked and he wasn't calling them. He's not into you. Right. That guy. That guy. The and, bad boy. Right. Yeah. Right. And then he, you know, he, he leaves. Also, he convinced her finally. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> he showed her enough times. But that feeling, that feeling, right. She finds somebody else and she's drawn. She's looking for that feeling. But what is that feeling really? What is it? It's toxicity. Mm. It's not... It's not necessarily, you know, people create these truths that I was telling you about, right? So it's like, oh, but it, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel, it feels safe, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes people need to go a couple of rounds with that in order to really see like, you know what, is that really what I want? And I tell them, I'll go, you, you're not convinced? I'll go another round with you if you want. And he'll right. show us again, but Ooh. he will show you yeah. And also, if that is okay, that's okay, right? If that's, you know, some girls want to chase that a little bit for right. a while, and that's okay. But I, more important to me is I say to them, like, like we were saying before, just so you know, you can do that differently. Right. That can be done differently. It's just a choice, right? right? If you choose to do it like that, you'll get that outcome. If we choose to do it differently... And, you know, kind of forces somebody to look at it a little bit, mm -hmm. right? And recognize that they're actually more in control than they realize. For sure. Absolutely. Okay, so sometimes people talk about, oh, I get butterflies around this person, early stages of dating, right? And they're chasing that feeling. But sometimes I think that feeling is like more anxiety or like yeah. nervousness. And I think people might be confusing that feeling. I know I've made this mistake. Yeah. They're confusing that feeling with butterflies as in this is a good sign. And it's like, no, you're just really anxious. <laughs> like your, yeah. your blood pressure and your heart rate is up because you're actually uncomfortable and your body is, that's how your body's reacting. That's, those aren't good butterflies. Yeah, and he's probably making you feel unsafe, yes. right? And when you're yes. feeling unsafe, you're feeling anxious. Yes. And here we are thinking like, oh. It's he, butterflies. It's so exciting, <laughs> right? And yeah, yeah it's, very, it's very true. And that's why I tell people in relationships, take it slow. Mm. Don't, when you don't know who someone is, you can't give them so much of yourself, right? right? Let them show you who they are first. See if they're worthy of seeing more of who you are. When you put all of that out there so quickly, 
you don't even know who this person is yet, right? right? So you can't act too surprised when they are like, uh, but he was so nice. I'm like, well, sure. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> but was he? I mean, you didn't really know him all that long yet. Slow, right? Slow. That exciting part of the relationship is wonderful, but it has to be cultivated to really understand, well, is this excitement yes. or is this anxiety? Right. Yeah. <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> like, what is this feeling and not allowing those feelings to like conflate with one another? But I just think it's nobody has this conversation early on in like your dating life, right? It's mm -hmm. just we're not experienced enough. There's not enough of these conversations going on. Like, yeah. Don't confuse what you think are butterflies with a good sign. You just are probably anxious because they're probably not good for you. Yeah. Or yeah. Like, they're not compatible for you, right? Right. Or, you know, they're at, you're at different places, exactly. right? Exactly. And that's okay, too. So when it comes to dating, what are some clear red flags in your opinion, right? So is it someone who's ghosting you? Is it someone who's like... I've heard, oh, you don't want to date like a mama's boy or and all these things. Like, what are some red flags for you when you're talking to your clients who's struggling in the dating game? Yeah. So, um, you know, very early on, I try to encourage clients to go slow. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Get to know one another. You know, don't feel pressured to like be more involved. Don't forecast that it's more than what it is at the beginning, right? Right. It does have to unfold. And people are at different places. Mm -hmm. And when somebody doesn't have the self-awareness to really recognize where they are at, they don't realize how much that's influencing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like they might really want to be in a relationship. So they're like, oh, I think like we should, I should probably introduce them to my parents. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> stop right there. <laughs> They don't get the parent right. just yet. Right. Or you can't push that agenda because that's mm -hmm. where you're at, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's when people will wake up and say, like, how did this happen? And I'm like, <laughs> come on. Like, yeah. I was here. I you remember. You. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it is important to look at those things because recognizing that this is just sometimes that's just where someone is at. Right. And I'll say, listen, you're looking for a relationship. So why are you looking there? Does that look anything like a relationship that mm -hmm. you, is going to be where you would like it to be right now? Right. And those are hard questions, but those are important questions to answer because that's going to really give you the clarity that you need. Exactly. When it comes to cheating in a relationship, in your opinion, with all your knowledge, I've heard the saying, oh, this person's not getting what they need at home. And that's why they're stepping out. Any validity to that? Yes. And, <gasps> uh, well, I'll explain. I'll okay, explain. I was like, no, not the cheaty. Let's yeah. defend the cheaty. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there are some people out there that just cheat. And, you know, that is not what you just described. No. Those people, for whatever their reasons are, right, are... People, maybe it's a shallow ego. Maybe they Ooh. feel the need to have constant validation or maybe they're scared that somebody's going to leave. So this is their own way of making them feel more confident, right? Ooh. You can't help that person, that right. person. And I won't help that person because, you know, you pretty much have an understanding of how I work now. And so if somebody says yeah. they made a mistake, right? There's always room for that. But just continuing to behave in a particular pattern because you choose to do so, there's no desire there, right? There's, there's no desire, yes. so there's no ability, yeah. right? But to answer the first part, now, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're not getting what they want at home. But, you know, when somebody is in a relationship and they step out of a relationship, mm -hmm. there is typically a reason. There's a reason as to why that happened doesn't always have to be anyone's fault. And typically both people are accountable in some way, but there is a reason. And very often it doesn't have to be a bad thing because it brings that reason to the surface, Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. right? Like remember yes. how I said when people are coming in yes. and when they come in there, there's some catalyst bringing them in. Well, that is going to bring it to a head 
and very often it's salvageable. I work with people after there's been, you know, somebody stepping out of the relationship and it makes them stronger. Wow. And sometimes, sometimes it's somebody's way of getting out and it's not the best way, but I can empathize with, you know, not knowing how there's a reason of some sort, right? Right. And so it allows that reason to be revealed. When you're having a conversation, let's say it's a couple, right? They're coming to see you and one person's like, hey, I want to have an open relationship or I want <laughs> to engage in a threesome or something like that. Yeah. Do people talk to you about that? And how does the other person react? And what does this mean? Um. So I have some clients that, you know, will explore right. different areas sure. in their relationship. And as long as both parties are, you know, willing, open, on board, and it's not the agenda of one or the other, mm -hmm. then, you know, whatever people choose to do in their personal life, if they feel secure. Now, if it's something that they were wanting to explore and this has not been something that they've done before, I will pre-position them around the stuff that can come up, mm -hmm. right? It's very different in theory, you know, thinking about it and maybe, you know, it's exciting and it sounds like a good idea versus all of what comes up around right. that when, when it becomes more real. And so <laughs> I will definitely point that out, but you know, different, different strokes for different yeah, folks, right? For whatever, sure. whatever works, as long as it's not the agenda of one and one is in compromise, right? Because right. that, that's a good reason to be addressing it in therapy because chances are one was, you know, the least needy and one was <laughs> the one who was the outspoken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting because I feel like in those conversations, the person who didn't have it as an agenda is, I would assume, is thinking right away, wait, have you been wanting this the whole time? Are you cheating on me? Yeah. And it can trigger, I assume, maybe not the word trigger, but it can provoke feelings of insecurity. Of course, yeah. And then yeah. I feel like people tend to react in a way because they now they're like, well, I'll do it because I don't want you to leave. And and yeah. like all these insecurities come yeah. up. So yeah. it's very similar to the start of relationships, right? Like very often in today's world, like where I was saying, I encourage people to go slow, take your time, get to know somebody, oh, yeah. allow that period, the, the beginning of a relationship to cultivate. Mm -hmm. Very often girls will feel like, well, if I don't sleep with him, then, you know, yes. he'll think I don't like him. And I'm like, well, what about if you do? And right. then, you know, I, I'll say, well, if you don't and he doesn't call you, then that's probably all he was looking for, right? right. And so you dodged a bullet. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, if you, if he does, if you say to him, I do like you, I would like to see you again. Right. Well, then you're giving it the opportunity for him to get to know you. Right. But I tell them very often, like, you he might have really liked you or there might have been the potential for the two of you to really like each other, but you brought intimacy in way too quick. Right. What? How does intimacy, I guess, throw a wrench in a relationship early on? Yeah. Well, you know, think about it. Like, first off, it's a, it's a lot, right? It's like, right. It's, it's, it's something that you really should feel comfortable and build toward. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has gotten lost in all, our culture and not even always by choice, right? So very often some will say, well, I didn't really want to. But so they almost are needing permission. So don't, so mm -hmm. don't just like wait and get to know this person. And if it develops into something where you feel like I can give this to this person, if that person shows himself to be worthy of that, then great. But right. if not, then at least you spared yourself right. all the intensity that intimacy oh, yeah. brings. And the, right? the baggage it can bring, right. you know, especially if it doesn't turn out in your favor. Right, exactly. Interesting. Okay, so with your expertise and your advice, do one night stands 
ever turn into a successful long-term relationship? Um, you know, I, I, I definitely think that there's the potential sure. for them too. And I wouldn't advise it, not because it can't happen, because the probability of the success around it is so much less. Mm -hmm. And But that being said, when someone will say to me, you know, I, I'm an adult and I went out and I met someone and I'll say to them, listen, if you're okay with it and you're being careful, right. that's totally fine. If you're looking for a relationship and you're hoping to see that this has the potential to go somewhere, then why don't you allow that to unfold a right. bit? Give it a give it a beat. Give it a minute. Know who this person is a little bit. I yeah. think that's really, really important. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned before that you pose different outcomes, right? You'll be like, well, if you do it this way, if you do it this way, this will be the outcome. And then you said, okay, well, we'll just go another round if you continue to choose this way. Yes. How often do you let them continue in this behavior before you're like, you know what, maybe I'm not the therapist for you or maybe, you know, we should not continue doing this if you're just going to keep continue, going. Continue Con to yeah. repeat the pattern. I, I won't give up on someone. I won't tire of them. I'll continue to hold that mirror up mm -hmm. because somebody has to be ready. I just won't enable it, right? I'm not mm, going right. to sit there and say like, oh, I don't know why that happened. I'm going to be more like, well, come on. Right. You can't really be surprised that that happened, right? And it's okay, right? And But it's important for somebody to take accountability. Accountability is at the core of anyone's growth mm. and anyone's ability to really cultivate themselves personally, their self-awareness. And so I won't say, oh, you know, again, yeah. <laughs> you're doing this again, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> no, I won't tire of it, but I will say it's okay. You know, it's okay. You're not quite ready yet. You see it, right? That's the most important part. You see it. If you see it and you understand when you are ready, you'll get there. Mm. But I won't ever ignore that it's there. Now, every now and then I'll get those clients, especially the younger girls, you know, mm. where they'll say, well, you know, I still haven't met anyone. And then I'll, you know, we'll do a little inventory check and I'll be like, well, remember, remember, <laughs> remember that one. And then, you know, remember this one who we continue kind of similar and it's okay, right? But when you are ready, you will do it differently. And until then, we're going to get the same outcome or I'll tell a, sometimes a great guy who's looking ready and looking for a relationship, but looking in a girl that is not, you know, he likes a particular type, let's put it that way. And mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the relationship type. Right. And you're like, well, here's the answer, but we'll go another round if you want. Yeah, and you'll, yeah. And you'll do that. Part. Yeah. Or I'll say, you know, it's great, but mm -hmm. that's not the relationship one. Right. That's definitely somebody who you are attracted to and you'll probably have a great time, right? And and she clearly likes you, but she's not looking for a relationship. <laughs> Nothing about her looks like she's looking for a relationship. <laughs> yeah. And you can't confuse the two, right? right you have right. to be able to keep that part clear or, you know, people really don't see those little pieces because they have their own agenda going on and they ignore those little things that you know, that I might be able to see a little bit more clearly. Do, do you ever get clients that are just like, just tell me what to do? And do you tell them what to do? No, but I will first say, well, what would you like to do? What's, mm. what's, what's your wish list? I'll mm -hmm. say to them, if you had every wish to do it a particular way, what would that be, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'll look at what's standing in the way of them maybe doing it in the way that they really want or... I'll show them how certain parts of their behavior are going so against everything that could achieve that outcome. Mm -hmm. right. You know, like, well, if that's what you really want, here's how to not get it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> We're going to have to do something a little bit more like this. Right, right. You know, so without telling them, it kind of allows them to see how if that's really what you want. If you've identified what you actually want, now let's identify how you're going to actually achieve that successfully. Because that's not it. That's not. And you know what? 
I was just thinking right now as you were talking and putting it together, it's almost like we are filling these gaps in for someone, you know, early on in the staging, in the beginning stages of a relationship. I think we fill in gaps or we're projecting what we do want yes. onto someone and they haven't, they haven't shown us that, right? Yes. Like, so we're filling the gaps in like, oh, I want them, you know, to court me more, whatever. Oh, they'll get to it. Yeah. They're just really busy at work. And so we start making excuses yes. to fulfill the missing piece that you actually want, the gaps. And yes, to, to fill the gaps and to ignore what is obvious, to ignore those red flags, right? Yeah. Like, well, well, he said he didn't want a relationship, but he called me from his mother's house. There it is. Doesn't that mean? And I'm like, nope. no, no, no. He's bored or whatever <laughs> it is. It's a, he just picked up the phone. How right. about that? He just right. called you. Right. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, I always will say to someone who, where, where there's, it could be a guy or a girl, but more often it's a guy who will say, no, you know, I, I don't want to mislead you. I, I'm not looking for, you know, not looking to be serious with someone. And sometimes they hold themselves accountable to that statement. Right. But sometimes they send a, they say it so they feel like, okay, well, I've put it out there. Right. Now I can make her think that I am, I'm yes. going to do everything <laughs> that I can do to make her, to go against what I just said. Right. Because then they're like, but he's doing this. I'm like, but what did he say? Right. She's like, but he, but he did. I'm like, but what did he say? So you're also a nutritionist specialist. What is that exactly? So I work a lot with eating disorder clients, mm -hmm. eating disorder clients who are in recovery. Um, I would say, you know, in my work, in the amount of work that I have done in my lifetime, I would say roughly 90% of women struggle with their relationship with food at some point or another. Right. Sometimes it's early on because they didn't maybe learn how to have a good relationship or regulate and maybe they struggled with their weight, so they struggled, but they learned it early on. Sometimes they were the people who could eat anything, and they thought that that would last a lifetime, and then it goes into later on they learn. But at some point, right, right, somebody's learning it. So the nutrition piece comes in for me in a lot of ways there, you know, and in, in again, allowing people to understand that the balance, right, not, not that all or nothing behavior, mm. And that is, that's something I learned the hard way. I see the women in my life learn the hard way, right? It was like, we beat ourselves up. It's like, well, I, I ate a burger, so I might as well have an ice cream right. sandwich and a pizza later and right. just call it a day, right? Right. Where as you get to know your body and understand like what works for you, and it wasn't until I had my children that I really got to know my body because then I wasn't really... It wasn't about me any longer, right? It was, it was, I was eating, keeping them in consideration and eating with the best intentions. And so that allowed me to really get to know what works. And it's always been an improvement since then. But with now with, with clients, again, I don't take a very conventional approach to it. This is my feelings about it, you know, eating disorder clients, you have to kind of understand where they're at and what the struggle is like. And sometimes people will say, well, you should intuitively eat. Well, if they were able to intuitively eat, they probably wouldn't have a disorder, right? And also, you know, you tell somebody who is restricting for two days straight, you need to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and three snacks. And they're going to lie and not eat any of what they told you, right? And so finding a middle ground, finding a place that, you know, I say to clients, they're like, well, I had dinner. And I'm like, I know, but you know, you don't, you don't want your metabolism to get worse. Mm -hmm. So you want to eat a handful of nuts, a hard boiled egg, an avocado, something that's very nutrient dense. And I tell them, I'm a realist. I don't want you to sit down and eat a whole burger at lunch, but have something that's going to allow your metabolism to maintain, or you're gonna eat a cracker and gain five pounds. And that mm. typically reaches somebody because they know what that struggle feels like. You know, it's like, just, so it's, it's training somebody to adapt to those types of 
patterns. Then in terms of like the body image and also just body wellness, body-mind correlation. Oh, yeah. Very I, important, I assume. It's very important. So when someone is just beginning in the process, I always encourage them to have mind-body correlation in some fashion, a routine, a schedule, something that allows them to correlate their intentions mm -hmm. to something physical, a walk, a workout, uh, Whatever, whatever it is that somebody enjoys doing, because it's so, it's such an endorphin release. It's empowering. It allows somebody to feel physically in control of their oh, person, yeah. mm -hmm. and it assists in the process so much more. It's like one big advantage in my favor when somebody starts taking control in that way. Mm -hmm. So I try to always encourage that part of the process, and then you know I always will try to build in allowing somebody to develop like intentions in the morning it places them much more in control like i intend for my i int i intend to be less preoccupied with negative thoughts about this person in my day wow and at the end of the day having some moments of gratitude moments of intention in the morning some moments of gratitude at night because when people are struggling, especially with like depression, it's very easy to feel like they don't have anything. Mm -hmm. Taking moments to recognize, and sometimes it's a struggle for them to even be able to recognize what that might be. And I'll help them. Well, you, you got yourself here. Mm -hmm. You got up, you brushed your teeth. Right. Those are beautiful things for you to be grateful for. Absolutely. And it's important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Something like opening up our eyes. Yeah. Taking a breath. It's like, no, those are things we should really be thankful for. Yeah. It's important. Yes. With your experience and your work, what are common reasons, the root reasons somebody may have an eating disorder? That can develop in many different ways. You know, mm -hmm. people often associate that with being a weight thing or that, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes there could be a connection, even if it wasn't weight related, meaning somebody can, you know, go through what is a challenging period. They lose a significant amount of weight because they're either restricting or they're so anxious. And then somebody comes and says, wow, you look so great. Mm -hmm. There it goes. That's the validation. It starts that cycle, right? Because then they're getting recognized. They're getting positive reinforcement and it's learned behavior. So that can come in mm. even when it's not about weight. It could just be, for whatever reason, they lost weight in an unhealthy way, mm -hmm. but the positive reinforcement creates that association and then it just spirals. But more often than not, it's about control it's about people feeling out of control in some way and that allows them to regulate what they can control within themselves right because you might not be able to control your relationship you might not be able to control your home life you might not be able to control your job situation but i can control what goes in and out of this body and that's how i'm going to exercise what i can control interesting would you say that's the same i kind of in the same wavelength of substance abuse. Is it similar or is that different? Um, so there's always a transfer of addiction. And so I've seen eating disorder people who are in working toward being in recovery and that addiction can transfer. Like I'm not gonna eat so much, so I'll drink. I'm not going to drink, so I'll eat a lot of sugar or I'll have a lot of sex. Mm -hmm. You know, it can transfer in a lot of ways what creates it at the core yes. is typically a bit different because substance, a lot of people lean on it to self-medicate mm. where this food issue is very often to regulate control in their lives. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. But there's a lot of crossover. I right. see a lot of crossover of the addictive personality in my eating disorder clients or clients who have had an eating disorder and are in recovery. But, um, you know, that, that addictive piece becomes part of 
what drives a lot of the behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be, you know, my, my substance abuse background played very heavily into my work with a lot of eating disorder clients. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So how does someone know if they don't need therapy anymore? So let's say someone's yeah. been seeing you and what are some signs that it's like, okay, I don't need to go every week. I, yeah. I, don't, need to, I don't need to see Christina every month. Yes. What are some signs that it's okay to pull back the sessions? You know, everyone is different yeah. because this process, as I told you before, can morph into many, many different things. So somebody might have come in for something that turns out it to be a completely different area of focus and and it evolves, right? So it it's all a matter of how long somebody wants to engage in the process. But it's so funny because when when there's been resolution and when somebody achieves a good solid sense of themselves and they've applied the modifications very a, a lot of my clients are with me for a very long time which i mm -hmm. love but sometimes they'll say to me you know i was thinking i might maybe come twice a week do you think that's okay i'm like do i think that's okay that means i'm doing a good job like right. how would that not be okay right that's wonderful i i i always meet clients where they're at in that mm. sense unless for some reason and they're typically correct right unless for some reason um, you know, somebody will say it at a time when I'm like, mm, I think probably you should wait until after this situation is resolved. Right. It's rare that that happens. And, and the opposite, right? Like sometimes I'll see clients twice a week, as long as I think that it's clinically justified to do that. Right. I've had clients ask me to see a bit more than that. And I'll say, well, you know, I think maybe that's a bit much, right? Like you have to watch that it's not someone becoming too reliant also. Ooh. Right. Because, you know, the idea is to get somebody aware so that they can sit and tolerate their own feelings. Right. And so right. I don't want them to grow too dependent, you know, while, but sometimes there is the need for biweekly at the onset, especially if something is really presenting in a way that, you know, it requires them to do a more aggressive approach. Mm -hmm. Just a few more questions for me. Um, yeah. Okay, so I am I feel it's going to be a therapy session, but <laughs> I'm I love a very high-performing person. Mm -hmm. I've always been this way. I'm sure it's rooted something in my childhood that's, you know, propelled me to be who I am today. Yeah. But very self-motivated, disciplined, very clear. And I'm sure others who are, you know, very well off in their life and they have achieved this certain point of success, there's probably many issues that we have. What would you say is the common issue that we face as high performing, functioning humans? Um, you know, well, first off, I think that when you're when you've reached a certain level of success, the issues that you're faced with differ than somebody who is dealing with more of the day-to-day -day things, sure. right? So right. the stuff that comes up and how you navigate oh, yeah. those areas, right? Think about it like as if you are in a position of mentoring mm -hmm. others as well. So you kind of have to lead by example, right? It's that accountability piece too. Like I feel like somebody needs to continue to allow themselves to evolve mm -hmm. into who they hold themselves accountable to be. Mm -hmm. And leading by example in that way allows you to feel content with where you are at and allows you to continue to grow, right? right. So that's one area. The other thing is I think that when we get to a place where you're achieving and you've, you've, achieved a certain level of success, it's important to, a, to be kind to yourself mm. and to be patient with mm -hmm. yourself and to be forgiving of yourself, right? Like there's a, there's a saturation point, right? Everybody right. has a ceiling. And so sometimes it's important to say, that's okay. That's right. where I'm at right now. And that's the best I'm going to do today. Right. And that's 
okay. And tomorrow maybe will be a day where I have a little bit more. Right. And take on more. And I also think as I got older and my experiences in life, I've realized I also am okay if someone doesn't understand where I'm at, where younger me would try to prove to you yeah. why I'm going through this and please care. And, yeah. and, and it's like, and I don't know if it's good or bad, but yeah. it's a very, oh, you like it? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't like me? No problem. Yeah. Where I spent so much time yeah. convincing, lending, trying, yes. spreading myself thin that again, I don't know if it's good or bad, right? It's like, oh, am I just getting, am I senile? Am I, <laughs> am I just well, now so like, so over it? But yeah. I don't know if that's a common concern. I don't, and I want to be thoughtful, but who knows? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's definitely a sign of a better solidified self-awareness within yourself. Right. Right, because you get to a place, I mean, I tell people, I'm not for everyone, right? And not everyone's for me. Right, and that's, that's okay. okay. <laughs> that's okay, <laughs> right. Fine. That's totally fine. And maybe the younger version would have made yourself. Oh, for sure. For everyone, right? For sure. And so that's in compromise where now you're reaching a point where you realize this is solidly who I am. Yes. I'm not willing to compromise. And if I'm not for you, that's okay too, right? Totally fine. Right. None, no offense taken. And it's okay. <laughs> you know, as I go through the process with people, what I will tell them is when you're growing, people will grow with you. Right. Some will fall off and they probably should have fallen off. Mm -hmm. And some won't probably come back because they maybe shouldn't have been there. Right. And others might fall off for the moment. Right. Because... They need to, or you need them to, but they come back. They right. resurface in a place where, and sometimes, you know, yeah. I mean, I can go on and on, but sometimes those people matter enough to us where we won't compromise, but we will recognize the limitations of who they can be. Yeah. Because, right, we can't just cut off the limited versions of people who are significant to us. Right. But sometimes they will grow and right. that's the idea right and you grow together yeah growth is hard yeah, yeah. hey Trine, did you want a self-reflection yeah that was that's like a breakthrough right when you decide that all right this person can only give me this much and i'm either going to be okay with it or not yeah yeah my self-reflection i guess if we're having self hey i'm all out there all right high achieving and i'm <laughs> over it that's kind of where i'm at in life so do you do you notice or what do you notice with people that come in and have problems, maybe me, maybe not, with <laughs> procrastination? Like, is there anything that is underlying with, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I can't, just, I just can't get over the hump. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there could be a lot of different things, mm -hmm. right? It could be that someone is overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? Somebody might feel overwhelmed. And for example, someone will say to me, my house is a mess. Like, I can't, I can't even, I, every day I say I'm going to clean it and I can't because it's such a mess. And I'll say, okay, if you keep telling yourself what a mess that whole thing is and that you're never going to get to it because it's so overwhelming for you, you're never going to do it, right? right. Because that mm -hmm. sounds scary and big. But I'll tell them, just clean this one table. Clean it and make it look beautiful. Just that, just that one. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you see what you've accomplished, then it allows you in small sections to tackle little things at a time, right? Because it's allowing somebody to have a plan. It's allowing them to see that they are capable of doing it in smaller intervals, mm -hmm. right? With a plan behind it. And also, you know, appreciating what they're able to accomplish in that small effort, not the all or nothing behavior we spoke about. People will say to me, I'll have to start the gym and I go six mm -hmm. days a week. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. you know, maybe go two days. No, 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 no. I go six days a week, every <laughs> week. Right. I'm like, well, how's that going? First off, right? If you haven't been going. <laughs> right. So, right. So it is just as difficult to tolerate the 
the two days, not the all or nothing, right? I tell them do two days for a month. Let's see if you're capable of sustaining that. Let's see what the takeaways are at the end of the month. Was a month enough? Was two days good? Do you think a third day putting that in there is gonna push it over the edge? And just getting somebody used to the, that moderation mm. is such an accomplishment because that all or nothing, right? Same with the food, the all or nothing. Mm -hmm. It's very tempting, right? And then it holds people back from yeah. accomplishing what they can do in smaller increments. So maybe, and also sometimes, you know, be us being too hard on ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We want it to be perfect. So we let perfect stand in the way of their being good. So recognizing that I'm not gonna get all of that done today, but my goal is to get this. I always tell people have a running list in your mind, a physical list. I mean, at this point now I do the running list in my mind, the, the must haves and the things that I have to get to that, you know, can't compromise around. And then the niceties, the things I'd like to get to, you know, that if I can't, they're going to carry over to the next day. Great insight. That is great insight. I don't know if, that, will that help you? I just don't know how, how, how long I can carry over the house cleaning till the next day. <laughs> like how long do I, do I let that carry over? That's until? not a must have. Yeah. That's a it's nice not, I like, If I think of all my must haves, I'm like, all right, I guess the messy table is yeah. not a must have. Yeah. No. But yeah, I just, I just wonder if people come in for things like you, you think about procrastination, you think it's, oh, that's just something you can get over or something. Right. Yeah. So to me, do people realize that that can really be something not only that's debilitating, but there can be something deeper than just not cleaning your house? Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, in, you know, at, when I first was responding to the question, I said, there can be many reasons. There definitely can be. I mean, very often when there's trauma, people are responding from a place of trauma. So that can create that kind of stuck feeling or the lack of ability to kind of move forward and, you know, working through that trauma and also building like skills around how to better manage taking steps forward, not Staying stuck in the, that internalized place of the trauma. So it can be related to that. It can be the truths that somebody developed. Oh, I'm not good at that. They'll say, mm. I'll say, well, that's never going to allow you to do it, right? If you tell yourself I can't or I'm not good at it, I tell them, how about you say, historically, I haven't been very good at that, but I'm going to try to do it a little bit differently now because everybody has a remember desire and ability. But if you if you're your harshest critic and saying, oh, I, I'm terrible at that, I never do it. Well, then you're creating a truth right. that might not be there. And eventually you start to believe it. What if someone just doesn't care? In the sense, that's why they're not doing something. Um, like they really don't care if their house is there. I, just as an example, like, yeah. I, I, not to simplify it, but maybe they just don't care to change their behavior. Kind of like what we talked about earlier. It's like, but you're not changing anything. It's yeah. only so many times that you just do something and you just don't care. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely a thing, right? right? So like somebody will maybe either not have a problem with it and openly say that they don't. And if they don't, then, right. you know, it's not my That's place to judge. Right. Exactly. But sometimes someone will say like, oh, I, I don't like this. I don't like this repeatedly. Right. But they're, they refuse to do it. So I will say, maybe you do like it. Maybe you do, right? Exactly. And sometimes people will say, I don't like it. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, your actions, you say your, it right. all the time, but you do it all the time, right? right. And that's okay. <laughs> that's that's <fine>. okay. <laughs> but you need to see it, <laughs> right? If you want to do it differently and you really don't like it, right? You know, you have to do it differently. You're not, you're not, it's not going to happen on its own. Right. It's hard work, all of it. Like, and it's just about unlearning and, and being uncomfortable. <gasps> I was just going to tell you yeah. that that was definitely a piece I wanted to share with you guys, yes. because it's a really important part of my work. And I tell me. always explain this to clients, you know, 
when I talked about how people will come in and, you know, that first phase of the process and like gaining awareness and then really solidifying that, that awareness and mm -hmm. creating a new version of themselves, right? And going through that whole change where people kind of feel like the foundation shakes a little bit, like it's a new stance in things. And then that next step is applying modifications, right? And, you know, people will say to me, like, is it, is that doable though? You know, like really, I've always done it this way. Right. And I tell them it's very doable. I have a great deal of success in working with my clients in this model. How I like to best describe it is it is very uncomfortable. Mm. And that is what works against people in so many ways because people might say to me, oh, I don't want to do it like this. I want to do it like this, right? right. And the minute they do it like this and it gets the littlest uncomfortable, they go right back yes. to doing it the way they always did it, that they told me they never want to do. Right. Why? Because it's familiar, it feels safer, right? So I tell my clients, tolerate the discomfort. Ooh. Eventually, it's no longer uncomfortable, it becomes a new truth. That's the goal. Yeah. That discomfort, right away they associate with like, oh, this doesn't feel good. Growth doesn't always feel good. It's uncomfortable. It's not painful. It doesn't mm. hurt you. But the change can be really uncomfortable. It puts us in circumstances that we can't identify. It doesn't feel familiar. Oof. And so it brings up a lot of discomfort. That's what stands in the way of so many people growing right back. Right. I love that you were able to differentiate being uncomfortable and painful. Yeah. Because sometimes I do feel that naturally humans, anytime we're uncomfortable, we just like get away. I don't want to be near this. This is too, it's too much. Right. But when you're growing and you're evolving and you're trying to, you know, become better for yourself. Yeah. It is hard. It does not happen overnight. And that growth is so uncomfortable. Yes. And it's important to differentiate it if it's painful or not. Yes, and you know, it's tolerating that first piece. It's recognizing and allowing the process to happen and then seeing it that gets you to that place because now having, you know, having done this for so long and mm -hmm. having good awareness around things, when something makes me uncomfortable, I'm like, "Hmm, what's going on there? Mm. You know, like it's interesting to me, like it intrigues me, like why did I react like that? Mm. Ooh, I R love that. Yeah, rather than feeling afraid of it, it I'm, I'm intrigued by it, right? Yes. Like I wanna learn about what that feeling, why did that reach me in that way? Because that's a potential area for me, right? Yeah. That's a, a growth opportunity for me. Mm. Oh, wow, I love that. So important. That's great. Christina, how can someone book with you today? <laughs> how can someone come and see you? You are a phenomenal therapist. The Aww, work that you do you is so, so important. I learned so much. And you made the space so comfortable for us. Thank you. Thank and you. And, and vice versa. You ladies did as well. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. But you are remarkable at what you do. Maybe it's the style that we gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. Like it's nurturing, but it's accountable. Yes. Yes. I'm going to hold you accountable. And I do think that's really important. How yeah. can someone book a session with you right now? Great. Terrific. So I work with um, Clarity Therapy NYC. We are a practice that's on Fifth Avenue, just off of 30th. It's a wonderful, wonderful space. I hope you ladies will come visit me one day. Yes. It's really, really beautiful. You know, our, our space is very innovative. And, um, you know, I, I loved becoming part of this practice. And even the concept is really, really uh, it's pioneer-like in the industry because the space is inviting. It allows you to feel like it just complements the entire process. And, you know, after so long of not having the ability to be in person to now be able to see people in a setting that kind of complements it is really wonderful. So Clarity Therapy NYC, um, Christina Mancuso. And so we have a website that allows people to go on. Myself, as well as other therapists, there are you know, all different types of therapists that vary. And the website allows for there to be some information, a profile and 
uh, tells a little bit about everyone, then you can schedule a consult. We offer a 30 minute consult to um, anyone who, you know, wants to sign up and, you know, kind of to see that's part of what is very innovative about the practice is that, you know, in the past, not a lot of intention was placed in allowing people to find the right person, yes. right? I always encourage people like to, it should feel right. People say, oh, I didn't know. Well, I tell them, well, how would you know, right? You don't know until you know. And it should feel right. It's a relationship. It should feel comfortable. It doesn't have to feel like, oh, this person gets everything about me, but it should feel like you have the ability to connect. Mm -hmm. And so the consult allows for there to be the ability to see if you're the right fit and then, you know, either we schedule in person or virtual. And oh, so you do both? I do both. I do both. I'm in person two days a week, and then I do remote work the other three days. Oh, my. Book Christina yes. right now. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Happen. Thank you. Thank you for the hard work and caring so thank much you. and sharing your wisdom and advice with us. I'm going to make sure to stop by because I just love, I the love conversation. It. You are amazing and anytime you have anything going on please let us know thank so that you we can continue supporting because that's really important to i us. absolutely will and thank you so much for the platform to you know have a message out there it really mm -hmm. means a lot i enjoyed speaking with you too so much awesome thank you thanks too